Good to be with you today, and um, we're continuing <clears throat> in our uh, series of God is Greater. And so this morning, our message is entitled, God is Greater Than My Weaknesses. We're going to be in John chapter 5 today. If you have a, a, your Bible, turn there. There's Bibles under the seats in front of you. If you'd like to take one of those burgundy Bibles, it's on page 885. And if you don't have a Bible... We welcome you to take one of those Bibles home with you. So God is greater than my weaknesses. It is amazing, church, the things that happen maybe earlier in our life that we remember, that just certain things that stand out, certain things we forget. But I remember a time when I was in elementary school and uh, my mother was frugal. That's code word for cheap. And... uh, There was a store in our little town, and this was before Walmart. There were other chain stores like uh, Sears and different things like that. But in the little town we lived in, there was a certain store. And I won't call their name because they're really a good store now, but back then they were kind of sketchy. And so when I was growing up, it was Levi blue jeans. And I mean the the big bells, you know, from the 70s. And I mean, you'd walk and they'd just flop along with you. But anyway, you know, that was the jeans. But uh, my mother thought they cost too much. So she would go to this certain store and buy my blue jeans. And it was kind of a store that maybe had seconds and all that. Now, let me tell you today, I shop at Goodwill, yard sales. I've probably got something on from, from Goodwill or yard sale today. But anyway, back then, this certain store. And she bought these blue jeans. And the one she bought me, they had two different tags in them. Now, the first tag that you would see in the jeans that she bought for me said Husky. Yeah, you get it. I was a little pork chop. So, you know, that's bad enough. But guys, let me tell you, if somebody brings home jeans for you that say relax fit, Husky, okay? So just get that. But then these jeans, and and this is a true story, there was another tag in these jeans called Irregulars. <laughs> now, that'll get you some therapy well, one, a little later on in life. But that meant that maybe one side, the, the pockets and everything, on this side, you might have a pocket down here. You're in the wrong place. I mean, it was pretty obvious. But they were cheaper. And so, you know, my mom would do the best she could. She'd fix them and make sure the legs were the same length on, on the jeans and all. But that, that was what... Uh, uh, you know, that's what I grew up with. And of course, when you go to school and, and Levi's are the gene, I'm so glad there's so many different brands now. It really doesn't matter. But uh, back then, you know, you, you'd get some ridicule. You'd get a little fun made of you. But then if the jeans weren't bad enough, then it came to tennis shoes. And back when I was growing up, the Converse uh, Chuck, Chuck Taylors were the, the shoes, the high tops. Well, they had kind of a knockoff of these. And we called them buddies, buddies for your feet, two for five, slip and slide, because when you bought them, I mean, you know, soles of tennis shoes should be rubber. These were like plastic. And so coming down the hall, they could hear you coming, flop, 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 a mile away. And if you were on the basketball court and you were going to make a cut, you would try to make that cut. You would just keep on sliding all the way out. I mean, you know, so two for five, slip and slide buddies. Between those two, I'm going to tell you what, I won't even go into the rest of it. But you know, it's amazing that some of those things that happened to us in our early life or past life, or maybe the recently past life, they stick with us. And some of them are funny, but you know what? A lot of them are not so funny. And they cause hurts in our life and scars in our life that maybe some of you, even though you're born again, you're still carrying that stuff. You're still carrying those hurts and those things. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today in our message, God is greater than my weaknesses. Uh, As a pastor, I see so many talented and gifted Christians that are sitting on the sidelines of Christian service and ministry. Many times they feel unworthy due to a perceived weakness or an insecurity that they've harbored silently maybe for years. And it's keeping you on the sidelines. You you know God wants more from your life and He wants you to be more than, than what you expect of yourself, but there's something that's holding you back. We're going to talk about some of those things today because let me tell you, I want you to know that my God is greater than any weakness, any hurt, anything that has gone on in your past. My God is greater than that. 
We're going to be in John chapter 5. This morning, I'm, I'm going to begin reading in uh, verse 1. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city near the sheep gate was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Now under these porches, crowds of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, they laid on these porches. And one of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today. And we all have stuff in our life, stuff from our past, stuff that's going on right now. And Lord, if we don't deal with those things your way, Lord, they cause us problems and they keep us out of the race. They keep us from being that wonderful person that you've called us to be. And so, Lord, let us examine your word. Let's examine how you handle these things. And that today we would apply those to our lives and walk out of this place today free and and unhindered from anything that Satan could use in our lives to hold us back. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. First thing that I want to share with you this morning, and and I have made this outline kind of personal. And so as we read it, it's going to be personal to us. And the first thing I want to share with you is a question. Am I handcuffed by my situation? Am I handcuffed by my situation? This guy had been laying by this pool of Bethesda for 38 years. I don't know if he'd been laying there 38 years, but whatever was wrong with him, it, 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 he'd been there for 38 years. He'd been sick a long, long time. You know, many times our present situation has to do with something in our past situation. And Satan wants to use those things. He, he wants to, to, to bring up our past and handcuff us or chain us to our past. That's one of his most effective weapons is you're living your life today. Today is a new day. When we got up today, the Bible says God's mercies are new every morning. Yet we woke up and all we could live in today and all we could think about was what happened in the past. Maybe what happened yesterday. Maybe what happened a year ago. Maybe what happened 20 years ago. Maybe what happened when I was a 10-year-old kid or a 5-year-old kid. And that dominates your life and dominates your thinking. This guy had been there for 38 years. That's a long time. Satan uses these things to keep us out of the race. I want to ask you, are you handicapped today by something from your past that's even stealing Christ's joy from being in your life? It could be, you know, I would hope that all of you grew up in a great home with a great mom and dad and, and, you know, everything was good, wasn't perfect, but I mean, you know, you're, and, and most of you probably did. I hope you did. But I've been doing this long enough to know that not everybody did. Some of you didn't grow up in homes that were so great. Some of you maybe grew up in a one-parent home and that one parent did the best they could do. Maybe some of you grew up in no-parent home. You were raised by someone else and they did the best that they could do. But you know, you know their scars from that. Maybe that parent didn't love you like They should have loved you. Maybe they said things. Maybe you were in a dysfunctional home growing up. And maybe it looked great to the outside world. But inside of that home, you knew it it was not good. And you probably dreaded going home. You would rather have been anywhere else but to go to your home. That's sort of my story. And so whatever it is, we can be handcuffed by our situations. And even though that might have happened years and years ago, it is still handcuffing us and it's, it's keeping us from being that person that God has called us to be. Maybe it was a teacher from your past that maybe they were having a bad day and you know you, you were cutting up or you didn't do well on a test and they looked at you, oh, you're never going to mount anything. And maybe they didn't mean it that way, but it went straight to your heart and you've never forgot those words. You know that old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me? That's a lie. You know it's true. Words do hurt. The things that we say to each other, the things, especially when we were children and didn't know how to process that information, those words that that people we trusted and thought should love us, gave us, they hurt us and wounded us. And even today, your life scenario is is living by those words. You repeat those words and it's, it's defined who you are. When Jesus says, I want you to be more than that, and we're handcuffed to that situation. Maybe it was a spouse 
that walked out of your life, maybe by no fault of your own, maybe a spouse that, that professed that they would love you forever till death do you part, but yet they walked out of your life and you just can't get over that. Maybe it was a church hurt. Yes, sometimes churches hurt people. I mean, if you've been to church very long at all, there, there's, there's churches that, that sometimes aren't healthy or people in those churches aren't healthy and they hurt us. And you know, I found out in my ministry that church hurt is one of the hardest hurts to get over. Maybe it was a personal failure in your life. Maybe a financial failure. Maybe a relation failure. Maybe some kind of social failure. Maybe something in your life. You just, you, you had great aspirations. And yet what you attempted failed terribly. And you can't get over that. That just plays that record. That DVD just plays over and over and over in your mind. And you can't shake it. And you know what? Maybe there's some sin in your life that you've been trying to overcome, you know it's a sin. You know it's displeasing to God. And you know what? You're sincere in it. And yet somehow you just can't get past that. And you're handcuffed by that situation. You know, Satan wants to keep us thinking about our past and living in our past. It's life draining. It, it's an anchor of guilt and shame and we hide it real well. We have that shame. We have that guilt of, of our past, but yet we plaster that smile on and everybody thinks that everything's okay. And how you doing? I'm okay. And you know that's a lie because we're not okay. Because we're handcuffed to something in our past, our situation. Well, let me tell you something. You can't change your past. I can't change one thing that someone offended me or hurt me by, and you can't either. But let me tell you, I serve a God that can change your future. Amen? I serve a God that can heal you today. I serve a God that can break those chains and un unshackle those handcuffs from your life. And, and some of you have never tried it. Some of you just think, well, this is my lot in life. Just, you know, gloom, doom, and despair, and woe is me. And I want to tell you, there's another life. And I, I'm speaking to you from my experiences this morning because I lived there so long. And I want you to know there is freedom. My God is greater than any of your weaknesses, any of your sin, any of your failures, any of your faults that you've ever had. Can I get an amen in the 930 service this morning? My God is greater than that. Put him to the test. Am I handcuffed to some situation? You know, most of you probably drove here or, or you rode with somebody to church and in that car you're driving, you're driving down the road and there's this big old piece of glass out in front of you and it's called a windshield. That windshield is clear and you got wipers and you should clean it once in a while and get the bugs off of it. Why? Because you're, you're driving that car and you're trying to get somewhere and you want to get there safely and you want to see everything that is in front of you. You want to see the future of that road and what's going on where you can do a good job driving that car to where you're going. But you know what? There's another piece of glass in that car and it's right up here and it's called a rear view mirror. And you know... The intention is, is to look through that big windshield when we drive. That is the safest method to get where we're going. But you know, there's a whole lot of people that are driving their life looking in the rearview mirror. Now, there's a place for that rearview mirror. There's a place that we should look back at times. We should review some things for a learning process. You know, listen, your past is a learning process, not a life sentence. Do you get that this morning? God wants to set you free from that. But you know what? If you're driving your life, if you're allowing your life to be driven and all you're doing is looking in the rearview mirror just as sure uh, as you were doing in your car, you're going to wreck that thing. You're going to run it off in the ditch. And if we're trying to move forward in Christ, if we're trying to move forward as the people that God has called us to be, but yet we are continually always looking in the rearview mirror, we're going to wreck that thing. We're not going to get where we're going safely. And so we have to ask that question, am I handcuffed? Am I chained to something in my life that, that is just keeping me from being the person that God has called me to be? We want victory. That's what God wants in your life. And, and, and God is greater than your situation today. Second thing, look with me in verses 6 and 7. Now Jesus shows up. 
here by this pool of Bethesda. And Jesus walks up, and when Jesus saw him, this man that had evidently had something wrong with him for 38 years, when Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? Now, I grew up in, in churches, and my daddy was a preacher, and he preached out of the King James Version. And I, this particular verse, you know, do you want to get well? I love how it's stated in the King James. It's poetic. And Jesus looked at him, and in the King James, he said this, Wilt thou be made whole? Isn't that, doesn't that sound neat? I mean, you know, do, and when he, when he says whole, it means not just physically, but your person spiritually, emotionally. All of these things, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to get well? And notice that Jesus asks, his, asks a question because he is a gentleman. He will not come to you today and twist your arm and force you to do anything. He lays it out there. Here's life, here's death. Here's freedom, here's bondage. Here's being well, here's being sick. Here's your past that you can't do anything about. And here's a future that I have a plan for your life. And he'll lay it out there, but he's not going to force you today. He's going to call you and give you these, these options that he has given us and he's going to want us to respond. It's interesting when Jesus looked at this fellow and he said, would you like to be made well? Wilt thou be made whole? Hey, do you want to get over this thing? Here is the man's answer. Listen to what he says. He's looking up at Jesus and he says this in verse 7. I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Now, it's not in the New Living Translation, but in the other translation, it gives a little explanation there. In this pool of Bethesda, it was said that at one time an angel came down and touched that water. And every now and then, at times, that water would bubble or move or something. It would, it would, you would see that it physically did something. And the first one, only one, the first one that would get down in the water after the water bubbled up, they would be made well of whatever they had. So that's why all of these lame and sick people and paralyzed people, that's why they were coming to this particular pool and laying there. Because, because evidently, something it was working for that first person that got down there. But this guy's excuse is, Lord, the reason I can't get well, you know, you want me, you know, do you want to get well? Yeah, I want to get well, but my strategy isn't working. Second thing, am I hindered by my strategy? We all have got a strategy. We have a strategy for about everything. We got a strategy how to drive. We got a, a strategy of where we're going to go eat after church. We got a strategy to do all these things. But yet, this guy's strategy on how to get healed wasn't working. And he told Jesus, I'm laying here. They're bringing me and laying me here. And, you know, the water bubbles. And, and before I can get down there, I'm lame. I'm crippled. I can't crawl over there. Before I do, somebody else gets in front of me and gets in the water. So here I am for however long I've laid here. And no, I can't be healed. I can't get well because I can't get in the water. Now, what was his strategy? Did you catch that in, in the verse here? I have... No man to put me in the water. In other words, what was his strategy? The world. The man-made things. That's my strategy. I'll just, whatever the world's going on, whatever the world offers, whatever the world's plan is, whatever the hottest thing going is, that's my strategy to get where I want to go. That's my strategy to be healed. Well, I'm going to tell you, it wasn't working very well for this fellow. I'm reminded of the hiker that was hiking on this treacherous mountain trail, hundreds of feet up. And he slipped and fell, but on the way down, he grabbed this little bitty gnarly branch. It looked like it would pull out any second. And he was by himself, and he was looking up in panic. And, and he looked up and he said, is anybody up there? And all of a sudden, this angelic booming voice said, let go and you'll be fine. He looked up and said, is anybody else up there? He didn't trust the strategy. He didn't have a strategy. And then when strategy was offered, he rejected that strategy. I was in a conference one time and the speaker was speaking and he was talking about our, I can't remember exactly what the focus was, but I'll never forget this statement. He said, your position today 
financially, relationally, socially, spiritually, is the sum of your decisions over the past three to five years. Now think about some situations in your life, maybe financial or relational or something. Probably where you are today is a sum, a culmination of the decisions you've made over the past three to five years. Now there's exceptions to that, I get that. You may have been dirt, dirt poor yesterday and you hit the lotto last night and today, woohoo! Just tithe on that, that's all we ask, all right? Just... Send your tithes in on that. No, no harm, no foul. So we know that relationships can change and different things, but most of the time, think about where you are. What's your strategy? Because your strategy probably has you right where you are today in all those fields, probably socially, financially, relationally, and guess what? Sometimes even spiritually is because of the decisions we've made. Well, you know what? If our strategy isn't getting us to where we need to go, where we know we need to be. We need to change our strategy. This fellow needed to change his strategy. You know, he keeps coming to the pool, but he had never found the right strategy. Don't know, he might have been there for 30 years, as long as, as he knew he was crippled. They'd been having somebody bring him and drag him. Now, I'm going to stop a minute. I, again, I, I like to use my sanctified imagination. I, I find some humor, a little bit of humor in this. And I think about this fella, and I think, what if that was me? You know, I, I want to have a strategy. Well, I'm going to tell you, obviously, he was crippled. He was, he was paralyzed. He couldn't do anything. But evidently, his thing was, before I can get in the water, somebody else gets in the water before me. I believe whoever it was that was bringing me down there every day, I'd have said this, hey guys, let's do this different today. I want you to bring me right up to the edge of this pool. I mean right on the edge. And I'm going to lay, you lay me down right here. And if I see a bubble, I'm just going to flop over. Ain't nobody going to beat me in that pool. I mean, this guy wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer. Anyway, he had more problems than that. I mean, if I'd been there a while, I'd have figured out how to beat those other people into the pool. Now, I think that's a little bit funny myself. I'd have done that. That'd have been what Randy Roper, that'd have been my strategy. But that wasn't God's strategy. God said, man, do you, do you want to get well? Do you, do, you, do you want to be made whole? And he gives the Lord his strategy and it doesn't work. What's your strategy today? Well, you know what? I've been hurt in my life, but you know what? I'd be a whole lot better if I made more money. That'd be a good strategy. Just make some more money. Maybe run in the right social circles. That would help my situation. Well, maybe if I change my relationships in my life, maybe, you know what, my marriage isn't working, I'm just not happy, let me just change spouses, let me just out with the old, and then that's going to be my strategy, that'll help me get better, that'll fix things, maybe I need a nicer car or a bigger house, because, you know, I want to influence people and make friends, maybe that would help me, and that's our strategy, I'm going to tell you, that's not God's strategy, He's got a different strategy. You know, some people might even say, you know what, I'm just going to give up on this God thing. I've been trying, I've been going, I've been, I've been walking, and it doesn't seem like anything, you know, isn't changing. Let me tell you what, it's not God's fault. I can tell you, when I, when I fail, it's not God's fault, it's my fault. Because God wants the best for me, and let me tell you something, believe this in all of your heart. God wants the best for every one of you that is in this sanctuary and every person. God wants better for us than most of us want for ourselves. We settle, sometimes I settle for good when God wants me to have the best. His strategy is better than my strategy. His ways are better than my ways. I like what Proverbs 14, 12 says. There is a way that seems right to a man. There's a way that seems right to me. There's a way that seems right to you. But the Bible says, but its end is the way of death. Let me tell you something. If you live your whole life by your own strategy, you're going to fail in God's eyes. You're going to fail. Now, you might win in the world, but the Bible says you can gain the whole world and lose your own soul. And even if God has saved you this morning, hallelujah, that you are born again. But you know what? There's more to our salvation than just being saved. He wants us to walk in freedom. He wants us to walk in victory. He wants you to turn those handcuffs and get rid of those things and adopt His strategy because His strategy will get you home safely every time. Can somebody say amen? Every time his strategy works.
This man was in the very company of God Almighty. He was standing before Jesus Christ. And yet he was thinking that man was his salvation. That man was his strategy. Is that us today? Is that you today? You know, you know God is there. You, you, you speak to him, you talk to him, you read his word. But yet somewhere in your mind, You believe it's man's strategy. The world's strategy is going to accomplish what I need. Let me tell you, you need to throw away the world's strategy, the world's way of thinking, and adopt the strategy of the person that made you and knows you better than anyone else, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Last thing that I want to share with you this morning. What have we talked about? We've asked two questions. Am I handcuffed by my strategy and am I, excuse me, my situation and am, I, and am I hindered by my strategy? If I didn't tell you that earlier, that's what goes in that second blank. Am I hindered by my strategy? And so now we come to the third point, the third part of our message, and it's in verses 8 and 9, and it says this. Now here, here we have it. Jesus has come to this fellow, been there a long time. He's been lame for 38 years, long time. Jesus says, do you want to get well? Man says, I have no man to put me in the water. So Jesus told him this, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat, and he began walking. The last one's not a question. It's a declarative statement. And it's one, thank the Lord, that I can claim in my life, that I can have in my life, I am healed by my Savior. I'm healed by my Savior. Man's not going to heal us. Man can fix some of our stuff and prolong our life and and take care of some diseases, but I'm going to tell you when it comes down to it, I am ultimately and completely healed by my Savior, Jesus Christ, in all ways. And that's the answer. You notice Jesus didn't even address the excuse that he gave him. Jesus didn't care because he knew he was greater than that. He knew that all he had to do was speak to this man. Do you want to get well? Okay, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Instantly, the man was healed, rolled up his sleeping mat, and began walking. I am healed by my Savior This morning, I totally believe in divine sovereignty. I believe that there's things God will do. I believe He has orchestrated things. Uh, I I believe that there's things He'll do whether we ask Him or not. There's things He He does when we pray to Him. But God is God. He is almighty and He is sovereign. But I also believe in human responsibility. Once again, I believe that God puts those choices out there. Here's life. Here's death. Here's freedom. Here's bondage. Here's healing. Here's sickness. Choose. Choose. I'm a gentleman. I'm not going to twist your arm. I'm not going to force myself upon you. I have given you everything you need. I have done the work and all I ask you to do is receive this gift to obey, to respond to me. You know, when Joshua in the Old Testament, he was standing there and he was talking to the people and he said, choose this day who you'll serve. You want to serve the gods across the river, the Amorites, the false gods? He said, but as for me and my house, we're going to choose the Lord. That was a decision that was made. The rich young ruler came to Jesus, wanted to follow him, and Jesus looked into his heart and knew that he had a problem with with material possessions. He said, go and sell everything you have and come and follow me. And the guy went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. It was a choice. He had to obey Jesus. Agrippa, when Paul was preaching to him, he said, Paul, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. Let me tell you something. Almost persuaded is totally lost. You know what the question is today? What are we going to do? with this man called Jesus. That's what it always comes down to. You're here in God's house today. I'm preaching from God's Word. I'm telling you His Word. It's not my Word. Randy Roper can't do anything from you, but I'm going to tell you, my God can do everything for you. But He demands a response. You've been confronted with truth today. And Jesus is standing and saying, what are you going to do with me? How are you going to respond? I'm offering you freedom. I'm offering you forgiveness. I'm offering you a strategy. I'm offering you a a wonderful walk in victory in your life. What are you going to do with my offer today? There's one thing that he won't do. He will not allow us to be indifferent to him. 
And in some of your hearts right now, some of you are struggling with things. Man, I've been struggling with this for a long time and I've tried to been, I've been doing it my way and it's not working. You know, I don't know. Can I trust God? Should I come up here? And it hurts when I think about all those things that happened in my life. And, and you know, I just don't know. Let me say, try him. Try him and see. He's, he's 100%. He never strikes out. He may completely deliver you today. He does that to people. Whatever your problem, whatever your past, He may just deliver you. But you know what? I'm more in a process. I gave Him all that junk in my life, all the stuff that happened to me when I was younger. And you know what? It's just a daily process. Me and the Lord walking through these things. And I've learned, like Paul says, His grace is sufficient for me and His grace is sufficient for you. Let me tell you what He won't do. He will not leave you and He will not forsake you. Never will our Lord do that for you. He loves you. He wants the best for you. His best for you. Well, we have some choices to make. Will we obey? Will we disobey? Will we put him off? You alone are responsible. You have saved in faith. Have you ever tried the restoration faith that God wants to give you and help you with the things that are hindering you? It's time to quit making excuses. Quit playing the victim. That was me. Boy, I could play the victim. Oh, look what happened to me when I was a kid. Oh, look, what poor little old me. You owe me something. You, you should be treat me special because, oh, this. And I'm going to tell you what, that gets old really, really quick. And I remember the time when God gave me victory over my past and healed me from that. And I actually stood there. I didn't even realize these words were coming out of my mouth. And I said, Lord, where you've got me today, I I wouldn't want to be anywhere else but where I am. And if it took all of that junk that I went through in my past life to bring me to where I am today, I accept it. And man, my whole life changed after that. I quit playing the victim. I quit blaming other people. And I began to walk. Am I perfect? Oh, absolutely not. Do I still have scars? Do I still struggle? Does Satan still try to bring that stuff up in my life? Absolutely he does. But I know that God is greater than any of those things. And He's greater in your life also. What is it today that God is calling you to stand up and pick up something? Pick up, get victory over that thing that's kept you down. Pick up that mat, pick up that hurt, pick up that past and begin to walk. And if you walk, you can begin to run. Will we obey him today? Medicine bottle. Boy, that's a big medicine bottle. You know what this medicine bottle represents? I was given this medicine bottle by a doctor because I was addicted to Little Debbie cakes. Am I? Yeah, I'm... My A1C got high. Over where I came from, they call it your sugar was high. (laughs) You got sugar, but they gave me this medicine to get my blood sugar down. And you know, I went to a doctor. The doctor examined me, took a blood sample, he analyzed it. It came back, said, your A1C, you're pre-diabetic, need to get your blood sugar down. He gave me a prescription for this medicine. I went to the money to get this bottle and I took it home and it said to start taking this the next morning. Now I did all those things. I went to the doctor, knew what my problem was. That wasn't the problem. I knew what my problem was. I had gone, all this, had the medicine right there. Now what if I'd have set it on that counter and never opened it and never took one thing out of this? It would have done me no good at all. None. No good. You see, you're here today and you know all the facts. You know all about Jesus. You know He's greater than anything. You, you've, been, you've been given the diagnosis and you have the prescription to stand up and walk and run for Him. And right here it is. Today's the day. Do I open the, do, do I, do I take the medicine? Do I obey and do what I'm supposed to do to get over this mess? And that's where you are today. Amen. And that's a response that we're going to have in just a, just a couple of minutes. And I want to pray with you before we have, and we're going to have a time of response. Some call it an invitation, time of decision. You know what I'm going to call it today? A time of response. And let me explain. We do this every Sunday. If you'd like to come and somebody pray with you for something that you just, you know, you don't know, maybe not even put it into words. You need somebody to just come alongside you and love you and pray for you. There will be people over here. If you come right over here and pray, they'll pray with you.
If you just like to come this morning and maybe what you have is between you and God and you just need to come and you know exactly what, what, what you've been handcuffed to and you're ready to get break that bondage today and you, you're ready to come, you just come right up here and you get down here and you just share that with God because He knows exactly what to do for you today. Maybe today your biggest need is this. I need Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I, I've never been saved. I don't know if He's a great physician. I don't know if He's my Savior. i got a lot of questions. All I know is today that I want this man called Jesus more than I want my next breath. You come right up here and me or somebody will come up here and we'll show you in just a moment how your sins can be forgiven and you can have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Lord, I'm going to ask you to stand this morning. Lord... It's not my words. I'm nothing. But I've spoken your words this day. I've spoken your healing, your victory, your forgiveness today. And Lord, it's time. Are we going to keep laying there and people walk over us and and just lay there doing nothing? Are we going to rise up and obey you and respond to the life-giving salvation and healing that you want to give us today? Lord, that's the question. Father, that we would follow the obedience and the leading of the Holy Spirit today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You come. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for checking us out online today. We would really love to connect with you, and there's a couple of ways that you can do that. Uh, One of those is going to connect.therivercc.com, and that is an online connection card. All that means is you're putting in some of your information and it allows us to be able to connect with you and build that relationship with you. Uh, There's also a couple other ways. One of those is our online prayer wall. Uh, You can go to pray.theriverCC.com and there uh, on that prayer wall you can put in prayer requests so we can be praying for you. But you can also see other people's prayer requests and uh, and lift them up in prayer as well. Um, You can also go to app.theriverCC.com and what that does is that allows you to download our app And there you can not only see the prayer wall and fill out a connection card, but you can see past sermons. You can uh, see events that are coming up and just all the ways that you can get plugged in. God is doing some amazing things here at the river and we're excited to be a part and we want you to be a part as well.